Right, good morning again, everybody, and thank you for coming. Uh, it's great to see you all. Uh, thank you also, Benoit, for the uh, kind introduction, and especially for the invitation to give a talk at this conference. And uh, even you suggested the topic um, as meta-languages. And, um, okay, we're at software language engineering. Software language, software language engineering is about the design, implementation, and evolution of software languages. That's its almost formal specification, which is a very useful and rewarding thing to do. You can probably actually sell uh, software languages once you've implemented them. Meta languages, in contrast, are for specification of software languages, not for their design, implementation, and evolution. So why should I be talking about meta languages at this conference? Well, first of all, what are meta languages? We have lots of meta languages around. And um, I apologize to the meta modeling community because I'm going to be restricting attention to what I know best in this talk, which is uh, meta languages for specifying programming languages uh, and uh, te textual uh, meta languages at that. For syntax, we have formal grammars. For static semantics, people quite like type systems and attribute grammars. Uh, it seems to be a bit of a schism in the community. But um, for dynamic semantics, there's much more choice. You have denotational, operational, algebraic approaches, and some hybrid approaches. In fact, back in the 60s, which is actually before I started research, as you might wonder, um, so uh, meta-languages was quite a hot topic. And there was even a conference about uh, meta-languages, essentially, um, with a delightfully ambiguous title, uh, Formal Language Description Languages. Uh, that was held in 1964. The proceedings were published in 1966. And you can actually get this occasionally on Amazon. So if, if you ever get the chance, I recommend you to pick up a copy. It's not available online as far as I know yet. Uh, and um, the, um, in fact, in those days, when they had a, a big conference like this, which was attended by very um, eminent people like McCarthy and uh, um, Peter Landin and, and Strachey and, and Van Weygarden and, and lots of other pioneers of computing. So they, rec uh, they took, um, they recorded the discussions at the end of the talks, and they put transcripts, edited transcripts, of those discussions in the proceedings. And sometimes the transcripts are far more interesting than the talks themselves uh, of, of the discussions. So um, I, I thoroughly recommend uh, that uh, as a, if, if anyone's interested in the origins of some of the ideas, of the early ideas of meta-languages, that's a good place to look. So we have specification, we have implementation. Now suppose, I mean, some of you, I guess, are developing software languages and implementing them. If you're going to design a new software language and implement it, would you start by specifying a formal semantics or even finish by specifying a complete formal semantics for your language? How many people would would do that if they're, if they're going to develop a new software language? How, how many, put up your hand if you'd give a formal semantics. Oh, that's better than I thought, actually. That's not bad, I'm glad to see that. Well, um, you should talk to some of your colleagues because very few major languages actually do have a um, complete formal semantics provided by their developers. There are many languages that have a formal semantics provided by other people in a kind of archeological autopsy exercise. But uh, the idea is that formal semantics should be useful during a language development process. Uh, and um, so Ada was a very good example. The Department of Defense commissioned the development of Ada and insisted that it should have a formal semantics. This was a language that was going to be used for 10 years for all military software in the States. Uh, and um, they wanted to make sure they got a good language. Uh, and um, for, for um, Scheme, the Scheme developers, I think, were much inclined to uh, denotational semantics and uh, very uh, happy to uh, exploit uh, semantics in connection with getting the details right in Scheme. For standard ML, uh, the situation was that they spent, uh, they invested a huge effort in uh, developing and polishing a formal semantics of standard ML uh, and published it as a book in 1997 uh, in, from Edinburgh. Uh, and um, John Reppy, when he developed concurrent ML, which was uh, intended as an extension of standard ML, um, uh, he also gave a formal semantics. Unfortunately, he couldn't uh, reuse the 
standard amount semantics because uh, concurrency didn't really fit in that model uh, and uh, he basically had to start again. Um, but all of the major languages, as far as I know, the developers did not provide uh, a formal semantics either before, during, or after their uh, development. Um, in particular, the Haskell community actually wrote down why they didn't do it. In, there's a history of programming languages conference, uh, the third instance, where they had a paper uh, where they explained and apologized uh, for not having done it or justified why they hadn't done it. Um, and uh, one of the reasons was that, they, well, they pointed at standard ML as an instance of a language that had a formal semantics. And the effort of producing that formal semantics was such that if the language was going to evolve, the authors of that formal semantics would have an awful lot of work to do to maintain the formal specification to co-evolve with the language. Whereas Haskell, they wanted to be able to, be, they wanted to be free to evolve rapidly. And they felt that if they, first of all, it was a huge effort to even start to write down a formal semantics of, of Haskell. But if they made a, a, a complete formal semantics of a particular version, then the effort of having to maintain it as Haskell developed rapidly uh, would be prohibitive and inhibit uh, and, and take time away from the, uh, all the interesting stuff which was developing the design and actually implementing it. Uh, and if you have knowledge of other major languages where the developers did use formal semantics, um, then uh, I'd be happy if you could let me know after the talk or in the discussion. So, on uh, yesterday on the keynote, um, Danny referred to find your dream and live it, right? So, he's not the only guy to have a dream around here. Um, my dream, if you want to put it in a, can it in a short phrase, is to make formal semantics as popular as BNF. Now, uh, this wasn't uh, an entirely um, original dream. Um, first of all, let me just say why I want to do this. So, really want to encourage language developers to use formal semantics. Why should they use it? Well, to document design decisions, first of all. If, if they make a decision to have a particular, like say, call by name versus call by value, then that should be documented somewhere, not just in their heads. So other people can understand it. So documenting language features uh, and design decisions. And in connection with generative programming, then if one has a formal semantics of a language which gives all, all the details of the intended behavior or the possible intended behavior of a language, uh, then there may be a chance that one can generate a prototype implementation from it. Now, one might say that um, one could perhaps combine implementation and specification and that people developing implementations, they could just write down an executable specification. But um, I'm afraid there's, at the moment there's no magic box that produces a production quality implementation uh, from a formal semantics. Uh, we're not quite there yet. Um, so uh, when we think of generating an implementation, it's generating a prototype implementation that allows the developers to experiment with their language and run programs uh, and, and see the consequences, maybe even see the consequences for reasoning about the language uh, from their formal semantics. Uh, but it's not uh, the magic wand that generates the thing they can sell. Um, maybe for d domain specific languages, one could hope that perhaps uh, a prototype implementation may be adequate for the users of the language, um, but uh, I'm not sure how much that goes on. Anyway, I was saying that this was my dream. Uh, it's not entirely my original dream. Uh, my um, thesis advisor, Christopher Strachey, uh, he, um, he, won he intended that denotational semantics, his flavor of semantics, uh, that he developed together with Dana Scott in the early 70s, uh, that that um, should be such that every programming language around should ultimately get a denotational semantics as well as a BNF. And so his motto was extend BNF to semantics. Uh, and tragically, he, he died in 1975 at the age of 58, um, and we don't know how much further he would have got had he had more time to do it. Uh, but um, in a sense, I'm trying to continue uh, his aspirations in that direction. The conjecture that I'd like to present today and argue for is that using a component-based approach to semantics 
um, a component-based semantic meta-language can significantly redu reduce the effort of language specification. And that's effort not, not only uh, to get started with a language semantics, but also to maintain it as the language evolves and to co-evolve the, the, the uh, specification together with the language. And I'll show you what, um, what language, meta language uh, I've developed together with many colleagues uh, for this purpose and see what you think about it. This isn't the first time I stand here in Vancouver and uh, propose that there should be a component-based approach to semantics. 13 years ago, Gypsy was held here, and I was fortunate enough to give a, an invited talk at Gypsy. Um, and there's a two-page paper with some references uh, in, the, in the proceedings, and I actually took a look at it before I gave this talk. And I was surprised to see that actually, in a sense, that was the statement of intent of where we are now. Um, it took 13 years to get here, a bit long perhaps. Um, I hadn't expected it would take such a long time. But uh, many of the things that I'd aspired to in that um, short paper, uh, like a good dose of semantics engineering is needed and component engineering, domain-specific formalisms, easier to read, write, and maintain, uh, those, those were the things, together with some more specific things about a, a component-based approach uh, that were already envisioned, in, envisioned uh, envisaged in that um, original uh, paper that essentially was the start of this approach to component-based semantics. So it's nice to get this invitation to come back and, and essentially um, try and say where we've got after those 13 years. Okay, so in general for meta-languages for specifying software languages, what do we require? Um, clear, concise, expressive notation, everybody would like that solid foundations. Tool support is essential for scaling up to anything more than a toy language. Uh, and um, one needs uh, tool support not only for um, checking and validating formal semantics uh, as well as other parts of specifications, but also I think for browsing uh, a language specification to go from uses of notation to their uh, definitions and, and so on. Uh, and um, crucially, because languages have a nasty habit of evolving, uh, then um, co-evolution of languages and specifications is a, a crucial requirement. And I would add to the list reusable components. And that, that's the, the idea, the, in a sense, the unique selling point of what I'm going to be talking about today. So I'll be focusing on dynamic semantics, um, I would love to be able to present stuff on static semantics, but uh, that's not ready for presentation yet. Um, let me just recall some of the early work that it, in a sense led to the approach that I'm going to present. This is Dana Scott and Christopher Strachey, uh, that who developed denotational semantics at the end of the 60s, the start of the 70s. And let me give you a little example. Um, I, I don't know how many of you were force-fed on this kind of thing in your uh, uh, computer science uh, <coughs> education. Um, if you're not familiar with this notation, then don't worry too much about it. Um, we have here uh, a direct style of semantics where we're modeling the dynamic semantics of an expression as a function from environments and stores to pairs of values and stores uh, to reflect that expression evaluation may have a side effect. Now this is in Scott and Strachey's original notation from 1971 where this star operator feeds in the value of the value and store pair that is given by um, taking the denotation of expression one which is the, um, the to be bound then to uh, I in this with the body in this let expression so in this environment row, it evaluates E1 uh, to give a value and a store, but only the value is then fed into this lambda expression and uh, is used then as the binding of the identifier I uh, when evaluating the body of the lambda expression. Now, um, a few years later, people were very much um, switched to what was called continuation passing style, which perhaps is more familiar to, to many people. Um, where uh, 
the store has actually disappeared from view, but it's actually buried in the, um, in the definitions of K and C here. K is an expression continuation, C is a command continuation. And uh, this is how it's written. You re read it from left to right. Um, we evaluate E1 in an environment and then give the um, value that's computed by E1. If, if it computes a value, then it applies this function as its continuation to that value V and then uh, evaluates E2 in the new environment uh, with the original continuation that was for the whole expression. Now that has a big engineering advantage regarding notation in that one can actually read it from left to right, at least if you're used to reading things from left to right. Perhaps for people from Asia, it's, um, they prefer the other version where you start reading at the right-hand end. Um, but uh, for most of us uh, here, then um, uh, somehow it was rather awkward to be having to read things from right to left. Uh, I, I think that the origin of the use of the star notation here was that uh, mathematicians are used to using uh, a circle for composition, and that also works that way around. Um, whereas computer scientists tend to write semicolons, and, and, or category theorists sometimes write semicolons and do things the other way. Uh, had Scott and Strachey originally uh, written their star with the arguments in reverse order, uh, then the problem would have been solved. But they never thought of that. And uh, what is even more curious is that essentially this star operator is the uh, reverse of the monadic bind operator. Um, and uh, they were actually using a monad even though they didn't know it. Uh, and um, uh, so uh, somebody who did know it, oh sorry, no, let me say just a moment first about uh, tool support because we, we looked at notation there. And um, so tool support, uh, here I made a contribution, uh, a semantics implementation system that essentially took a denotational semantics um, and generated a lambda expression from it uh, and, and then uh, given the inputs to a program which we could also represent in some kind of um, impure lambda notation uh, then uh, make a formal application of the two and reduce it with a lambda interpreter. So it essentially converts everything in sight to a lambda expression and evaluate using partial evaluation on lambda expressions. Uh, and that allowed one to uh, run programs according to their denotational semantics and uh, primarily to debug uh, the semantics and get it right. Uh, and um, this was a, perhaps the high point in my career um, back in the 70s um, with um, impact in that the developers of ADA, the successful consortium in France uh, that uh, got the contract to develop ADA, the green language it was called in those days, uh, as an example of the kind of formal semantics they were going to give, they included um, a mini language that was actually running in, in this SIS system in the bid for the contract. And they got the contract, okay? So that doesn't say that it was because of the fact that they had um, something based on, on my work in there, but at least I didn't stop them getting the contract, right? Uh, so um, I, I felt very gratified about that. Uh, as Ada then started to become developed more and grow, uh, the uh, size of the language started to expose the poor software engineering of the system and the developers started to feel the strain and then switched to using a meta language which was essentially um, a higher order extension of an applicative sub-language of ADA itself. So they were giving then a meta-circular definition which is not the best thing to do but, um, and, and, but I guess they had more uh, in-house tool support that they could use for that. But regarding coevolution of languages and specifications, the original denotational semantics notation was not good at all. Um, essentially, it's like a large functional program with complete exposure of all the data types. Uh, and you may, when you want to add something to a language, you need to complicate those data types and, and you have the expression problem uh, with uh, then having to go and uh, update all, all your function definitions uh, and quite radically change the patterns of lambda notation used to express these denotations. And there were the only reusable components that you could identify were the lambda notation itself and uh, maybe some domain constructors. Then along came Eugenio Moji in the late 80s with monadic style of semantics. This isn't actually his original notation. This is from a paper by uh, um, Xiang and, and uh, uh, Hudak in ESOP 96, uh, where they talked about modular denotational semantics. So here we have um, monad transformers that add features to an underlying mo monad of computation. And the star operator of Strachey has be um, become 
uh, this infix, uh, which in Haskell is written with, with, with some symbols, but um, uh, uh, Yang and Hudak, uh, they, they, um, uh, they wrote it as a word, word uh, then. Um, and here you see that when E1 has computed a value, then we uh, grab a copy of the current environment. So that's because we can do that because we have the environment monad transformer here. And do something with it and then evaluate E2 in the environment that has been adjusted accordingly. Uh, and um, having a, the state here just reflects the possibility that we'd have other constructs in the language that would have side effects. Uh, and um, essentially this was solving the modularity problem for denotational semantics to a large extent. Coevolution, oh, tool support, one could do prototyping in languages like Haskell and, and uh, Scala and, and so on. It's uh, fairly straightforward to embed uh, denotational semantics uh, in monadic style as, a, as a, an embedded uh, domain-specific language. Coevolution is pretty good. There are some concerns about monad transformers as reusable components regarding the fact that they're sensitive to the order in which they're composed regarding the monad you end up with. Not, they don't always commute. And um, when one has a lot of them around, there's a lot of lifting of notation that needs to be done uh, to support um, getting all the notation in the result monad. But anyway, great advance. Around the same time that Moji was doing that, I developed something called action semantics. Uh, the problem of choosing a snappy word like action semantics is other people also choose it. Uh, Robin Milner had action systems, and of course the UML community had also something called action semantics, which is somehow related but not quite the same uh, as the action semantics I developed. It looks a bit more verbose, especially compared to Strachey's uh, original notation. Um, and these uh, bold words here were from the action notation that was provided as in this framework. And had a predefined meaning which was defined using structural operational semantics, which I'll come to in a moment. Uh, and just like with the, oh, and one had here some fairly expressive effect type system, type, uh, effect typing system uh, for the actions that, uh, apart from just mapping a, an expression to an action, uh, one said something about what that action would do uh, when it was run or, or enacted. So coming evolution was pretty good. But again, reusable components were not really there. The, um, the definition of action notation was just a non-modular SOS. You could take it or leave it. If you didn't like it, you left it, and most people left it. Um, so, uh, uh, but anyway, there is a book about that that you can read if you're interested. A fair amount of tool support was developed, uh, and uh, I had some good um, PhD students in, in Denmark, and, and they were very keen. Uh, also work went on in, in Glasgow uh, developing uh, a um, system compiling action notation into C so as to be able to run programs that way. Uh, there was a project uh, done by the Open Software Foundation uh, which was to define what was called the architecture neutral distribution format, which I, I think uh, was a failed project. But um, they, it, um, part of it was that they needed a definitive definition of the language, um, definitive definition, sorry, a definitive specification of the language, uh, and they chose to use action semantics for it. Uh, and um, because I couldn't provide any sensible tools at the time, uh, they chose to use the RAISE tool set for the RAISE specification language. That's a wide spectrum algebraic specification language and embedded action semantics into that. Uh, and th they managed, um, they, 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 it was quite gratifying having just developed action semantics to find a user, um, not even an academic user, but a semi-industrial um, project. Later we developed some tools uh, using the ASF SDF meta environment, and there was also an action compiler to standard ML. Um, so there was quite a bit of tool support around, but um, the lack of, of, of reusable components was not so good. I mentioned structural operational semantics, which was used to define the um, notation used in action semantics. This is Gordon Plotkin, who um, visited Aarhus for six months in 1981 and wrote some very nice lecture notes that became very seminal and influential. And if we take that same little running example of let expressions, this is how it looks in, in his notation. Incidentally, you can find a, a, a published version of his lecture notes 
uh, published in the Journal of Logic and Algebraic Programming in 2004. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll put some references at the end of the slides and make them available. Um, so uh, if you want to find the online versions of these various things, um, then, then you'll be able to do it from the last slide in, in, the, in the deck. So this is a small step semantics. And I'm going to spend a, a minute or two just explaining it. So first of all, the judgments uh, for these uh, inference rules are, are given here. We have an environment, an expression, a store, and then a, a resulting expression having made one small step of the computation and a possibly changed store that results from that step. In general, you can also use labeled transitions in uh, structural operational semantics, but in this case, there's no need for the labels. So let's just go through these rules. And uh, the reason why I'm wanting to help you understand this will become apparent in a, in a few moments. Um, so small step semantics says, OK, we, it's a rather boring rule. It says that, well, the first thing we need to do is evaluate E1. So let's allow E1 to make a step um, and maybe produce a new sigma prime. And so then we update the term that we're evaluating to reflect that change. When E1 has evaluated to some value V1, uh, then we can start evaluating E2, the body of the let expression, in an adjusted environment that reflects the uh, local binding of I to V1. And when that expression, if, if, if and when that expression evaluation terminates with a value V2, then this local binding is no longer needed and we can just uh, forget about the let and reduce the value of the let expression to just V2. And there was some tool support for that. Um, Gilles Kahn uh, and his group in INRIA, uh, they developed uh, a system called TIPOL, uh, which um, was essentially based on natural semantics, which is a big step version of structural operational semantics. Uh, and um, also in, in Sweden, uh, uh, there was um, Mikael Pettersson and um, uh, other people developed a uh, also an implementation of big step semantics. A small step semantics, a, a Dutch guy called uh, Peter Hartel developed a, a system called Letos. So there's some tool support around. But again, just like with the original version of denotational semantics, this was before monads, coevolution was poor and there were no reusable components around. So why, why, was, why was it so poor at that? Well, take a look at those bits in the, in the rules. They're really, really boring. They have nothing at all to do with let expressions. We could have let expressions in a pure language, and you wouldn't write those stores there. If, if they're written there, it's implying the language has stores. One shouldn't write anything that isn't intrinsic to the construct being specified. Okay? We need to write environments because we're going to be adjusting the environment. But the stores, it's just reducing modularity, reducing reuse possibilities to, to mention them there. Even with the environments, it's pretty obvious that the environment used for E1 here, it, if you don't want to adjust it, then it stays the same. And similarly, you don't even refer to the environment down here. Why mention it? And the store here, if um, one has just a primitive and it just makes a, a, a kind of housekeeping tidying up step, then um, if one doesn't mention any change to the store, then the default is that it should just stay the same. OK, so having those, on the other hand, this um, bit of, of the environment is, of course, crucial because that is, is capturing the idea that we reflect the local bindings of, the, um, of I to, to the value of the uh, first expression when evaluating the second. So there's no way one can get rid of that. So having noticed that, um, in the late noughties, I, uh, together with a student in Swansea uh, developed uh, what we call implicitly modular SOS, or IMSOS for short. Um, and here we just state up front that this is optional to have explicit mention of the environment. So when we don't want to mention it, we, we just leave it out. When we do want to mention it, we can use it. And that dramatically increases the modularity. It's, it's engineering of notation to increase the modularity and reusability of um, these operational rules. So that's the kind of thing I mean by engineering metalanguages to get notation that supports reusable components. So um, coevolution becomes quite good. Uh, we developed some tool support. I won't go into the details there um, for small step. And more recently, 
in Spoofax, there's a language, a meta language called DIMSEM, uh, which uh, essentially is based on a big step version of IMSOS with some improvements and advantages. Uh, I think uh, Vlad Vergu, who uh, was the prime developer, is in the room somewhere. Vlad, are you? Is Vlad here? No, Vlad has escaped. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, and uh, Ilko um, Visser at the back there uh, was um, very much uh, influential in, in uh, transferring the technology behind IMSOS into Spoofax. And um, it's led to a fruitful collaboration. So co-evolution was pretty good. Um, for instance, one can combine this rule with rules that talk about the store, and the store will just propagate in the normal way, um, in, in, in the way I explained on the previous slide. There's still a, a bit of problem with reuse of this. For instance, suppose we have um, a language that has different notation for local declarations, like any imperative language that uses begin and end or, or curly braces and has declarations rather than that. So we wouldn't be able to reuse this kind of rule uh, directly because it's based on the concrete syntax of a, or, or the abstract syntax, whatever you want to call it, uh, the syntax of a particular language using mnemonic notation. It doesn't even help to use um, abstract syntax for a particular language because people may have different names for the constructors of the abstract syntax in another language and then again it would be tedious to do a, a sort of kind of formal translation of the notation. So the, um, the, there's still a, a problem there with the uh, rules not being uh, reusable. So um, a bit later in the in the late or sorry in the mid um, 2000s, together with um, a PhD student in uh, Denmark and Mark Vandenbrand uh, from um, uh, the Netherlands, uh, we developed something that we called constructive action semantics. Again, a bad choice of name uh, because um, uh, uh, Gerard Berry in, in France had chosen constructive semantics for something completely different, um, so we later dropped that. Um, but in any case, this had a rather short uh, time of, of, of uh, development and exposure, uh, we finally got reusable components. And we did that by having what we called a basic abstract syntax, BAS for short. Uh, and it was like a high level version of action notation. It had things like local and bind val. So local in action notation was expressed by a combination of an infix and a prefix. Uh, and um, this was reflecting more directly uh, having things closer to the level of a programming language. We also uh, developed tool support based on, again, ASFS SDF in, in the action environment. Coevolution was good, and we finally had reusable components. But there was still a, a problem. The problem was that we were using action semantics to define these basic abstract syntax, uh, what, what they meant. So we, we were mapping a language to basic abstract syntax, but then to define this basic abstract syntax, just like we defined action notation in SOS, so here we were using action semantics to define BAS. And having a translation from um, the language into this basic abstract syntax, and then action semantics being a translation from the BAS into action notation, we had to essentially the composition of those two translations, which was a bit heavy to work with. Uh, the, the tool managed it, but people didn't. So um, it, it was, uh, uh, didn't last very long. So this leads me uh, to component-based semantics, which we've been developing after that experience, where we don't use action semantics directly to define anything, where we have uh, what we're going to call fundamental constructs, uh, which are very reminiscent of those from the, the BAS, the basic abstract syntax, like scope and bind. And this is how, finally, we write the um, dynamic semantics of our let expressions in this component-based approach. Uh, and the notation here is that eval is mapping expressions to computations which, if they terminate normally, compute um, elements of the type values. The values here is actually a name of a type. We have some tool support, which I'll demonstrate in a moment or in a few minutes. Uh, and um, coevolution is good, and we do have reusable components and we don't use action semantics. And this is what I'm going to be presenting in the, um, in, in the next um, five, 10 minutes, I guess. And well, I'm pretty happy about how that looks. You can just compare it, recall what, how the other formulations looked, starting from denotational semantics through 
with monadic version and in structural operational semantics. Uh, and and I'm, pr I'm pretty happy with having that conciseness and readability for the uh, defining the semantics of a let expression um, in, in some language. Note that this, this specification is not the reusable component. <clears throat> it's the definitions of scope and bind that are the reusable components. Uh, if we have a different language, we may have different terminal symbols, different non-terminals, different meta-variables, uh, and uh, we may want to, to change this. Um, so this is not a reusable, not inherently a reusable component in itself. It's the definitions of scope and bind and other things that we'll see in a moment. Okay, um, so these reusable components, fundamental constructs is a bit of a mouthful, so just calling them funcons as a kind of analog of functions with effects. Uh, and um, they're independent of particular programming languages. The reusable components are the specifications of these funcons. And the language semantics is just given by, very much like in action semantics, by translation of the language constructs to funcon terms. And once you've done that, then you get the language semantics for free from the semantics of the funcons. So that's the basic idea. Let me try and visualize it, how things look. We have lots of programming languages out there. And even worse, for each language we have lots of versions as it's developed. To give formal semantics for all those is a big ask and I'm not going to manage it in the rest of my career. But the principle is that all those languages should be translated in principle to a fixed, sorry, not a fixed, but a, a collection of stable reusable components, these funcons. So we said we translate the syntax of a language into funcon terms. Many different languages should be translated into the same collection of funcons. Uh, some languages may translate, may, may exploit some funcons, others others, but uh, the idea is that um, the um, the full repertoire of funcons is available to all languages if they choose to use it. This has some implications regarding um, modularity, and in particular, uh, we'll insist that each funcon has a, um, w w for each bit of notation, for each symbol that we have in our notation, we have a, a particular funcon. We, we don't have overloading. We don't have, um, we don't have two, uh, we may have, perhaps some aliases that say maybe have a short form and a long form of the name of a funcon. But uh, basically the idea is that if one sees uh, the same symbol used like say scope or bind used in two different languages um, then in, in, their, in their specifications of their semantics, then it means the same. So we want uh, to have all these languages uh, using the same symbols to mean the same things. And uh, so essentially we, we don't have uh, different definitions of the same symbol uh, in this repository, which is a, a bit, um, one has to be a bit careful because unlike action semantics, where we said for action notation, we, we thought of everything that we needed to have in semantics. Uh, we have things dealing with um, contexts and, and uh, imperative features and concurrency and things like that. So action, action notation was a closed world. Um, here, we're not quite so um, arrogant to think that we've already imagined everything that computing is going to involve, um, not only now, but in the future. Uh, so it's crucial that we can extend and add new funcons and do it in a way where we don't have to make any changes to the previous ones when we add a new one. If we add a new funcon, then this should be such that our previous funcons are, that their specifications are completely stable. To have to go and change all their um, definitions uh, when it adds a new funcon will, will be prohibitive. Not only that, we want it so that we don't even change their algebraic laws. I mean, if we have sequencing, for instance, that's associative, then it remains associative however many funcons we add to our repository. And achieving that was um, uh, essentially based on some of the work that was done on operational semantics, and I'll explain that in a moment. So that's the big picture. We, we have the same collection, open-ended collection of funcons, 
that can be used in defining different languages. So let's see how it looks in practice. This is just the full version of that fragment that you saw before, where we have a definition of syntax. Uh, we have that, uh, you've, seen, you've seen this bit before, but the, uh, here we see how we specify essentially abstract syntax, uh, although we also use it to generate parsers uh, in our formalism. Let's look at a, a different example to illustrate uh, how we deal with coevolution. So here we have a, a, a while loop. Um, while loops in different languages, uh, some test for non-zeroness, um, others test for uh, true or false. Um, here we get the hint that this is going to be based on Boolean tests by uh, the, um, the use of the while true uh, notation here for the fancon. But a basic while loop is such a fundamental construct that we shouldn't be surprised that it has a one-to-one -one map. It doesn't really require any thought to translate it into funcons. We have um, a funcon already that represents the standard um, notion of a while loop with a Boolean value to test and that just continues uh, until the uh, test becomes false. Now, um, not everyone is happy with that while loop. Um, so suppose we, our language developer wants to change the idea about having Boolean tests, maybe doesn't have Boolean values at all, but wants to deal with numerical tests. So we make invasive change in our specification of the translation and insert a wrapper around the evaluation of the test to convert it into a Boolean, because now the test is computing a number uh, and we are wanting to um, actually feed a Boolean value into this. So this is how we would write it in, in our FunCon notation. Um, using existing funcons for uh, negation of Boolean values and for testing equality of, in this case, integers. So we still use the, the funcon for the plain old while loop, but we've managed to lift it uh, to specifying the semantics of a while loop with a non-zero test. So that's the kind of way that we support coevolution fairly straightforwardly in, in this framework. Incidentally, I should mention here that uh, this no value result here is that we don't intend statements to compute a value of interest. Uh, it's, it's a bit like a null value in, in, in uh, C-like languages. Um, we don't want to do anything with the value computed by uh, a statement, so we just say it has no value. That's a, um, that's a type that has just a single um, value called none. Slightly more invasive change is if we want to deal with abrupt termination in the body of the while loop, where we have now, we add a break construct to our language, and we need to accommodate that in our translation. Well, we can actually, suppose we've gone back to our Boolean version, we can still use the plain old funcon for while true, but we, now we need to do a bit more wrapping, and perhaps it doesn't look so nice at the moment. Um, so let's see what it says. It says, we're going to represent a break by abrupt termination of um, which is represented by throw uh, in our funcon notation uh, with a reason that just says we've, we've broken. We've, we've broken the flow of control. And um, we then put in a handler which is going to check whether that um, essentially exception is raised uh, with that particular reason. And if in that case, if it is, uh, if the body, um, if, if the body of the loop here, or even the test, I suppose, uh, does a break, uh, then uh, in that case, we terminate normally, saying there's no value, um, which is represented by the, va the value none. Um, if we ab terminate abruptly for any other reason, uh, then we just uh, rethrow the reason uh, to terminate abruptly in the context. Now, that doesn't look maybe so nice. Uh, we have actually notation that makes it look a bit nicer. We have an else primitive that, and, and a case primitive uh, where you do pattern matching here and, and, and uh, a bit more concise. And you could even go further and have a phone con that represents catch else throw. So this is a balancing act, right? We, we, we have a possibility to add more and more complicated phone cons, more and more close to things we perhaps have in our language um, and define, the, define them by rules. But as we make them more complicated, the rules get more complicated, but the translation gets simpler. Languages are complex. We're getting complexity by having um, some complexity in the translation, some complexity in the definitions of the things we're translating to. And it's a balancing act to try and get a sweet 
um, point where we get the required complexity with rules that are sufficiently simple and translations that are sufficiently simple. Action semantics got it wrong there. The translations were too complicated, as Jens um, may remember from his thesis days. Um, but um, we have a lot more flexibility here, and uh, we, um, we think that we can exploit it to give really readable um, definitions of constructs. So tool support, I'll try and give a bit of a demo now. Um, and I'll, I'll show some, briefly some definitions of fun cons um, in, in a, uh, after the demo. I'll only give a very brief demo just to show how things look in the tool. Um, so we have something called CBS Editor, which um, is used for developing language and fun con specifications. Uh, it generates parsers. It, uh, it does, um, sorry, it, it, CBS Editor parses the specifications. It also does name resolution. It doesn't do full type checking yet. Um, it, it generates language editors and it's implemented in Eclipse. The language editors, it generates pro parse programs and translate them into fun cons. And we've integrated it with some Haskell tools which um, allow us to run the, the fun con terms based on their, um, based on their um, definitions in CBS. So I'll just give a quick demo just to show how it looks, but I'm not going to spend too long on that because I want to leave time for questions. Um, so let me... Just um, get into Eclipse and show something on the screen. Right, so um, here we have here we have Eclipse with um, some navigation. We're not going to be using the navigation for very long. Um, the um, let's just take a look at the root of the. This is a definition of a little language called imp. And if we um, open this, we see that there is a, a language name that, that is used to link together all uh, a collection of files that are all defining the same language. And it also distinguishes specifications that are defining languages from specifications that are defining fun cons, because the vis visibility rules are different. Basically, languages don't see anything that's in other languages. Um, Imp language won't see anything that's in, in some other language, uh, but they all see the fun cons. And um, there's some boring stuff at the beginning, but we have these various uh, sections of the language, and I'm just going to brief briefly show each of those. And um, the, we're not going to need the navigator anymore for a while, because uh, the section numbers here are actually hyperlinks to the um, various can you still read that, I guess? Okay. Um, so we have a section number up here, um, and the section number mentioned on that previous file was a hyperlink to it. Um, so here we see how we define syntax, we define some rules, and uh, the tool checks that we make correct use of variables. We don't have um, unmentioned variables in the right-hand sides, and we don't have duplicate variables in the left-hand sides. Um, and um, the, all the, if we hover over the various symbols, then we can, um, I'll show you later, going to one of those uh, to see how it looks. Um, we also have, uh, down at the bottom here, we have relatively boring stuff concerning lexical level with um, numerals and with um, identifiers, uh, where we can deal with also the micro semantics of, of those things as well. Let me go back to that first one. So, Boolean expressions. Kind of Boolean expressions you might expect in a, this little imp language. Um, and uh, in particular, let's just quick look quickly at the translation of the shortcut uh, conditional uh, conjunction here, uh, which actually doesn't use conjunction. It uses uh, if and else, so that the um, in the case that the the first um, uh, expression has a, a false value, then we don't evaluate the, uh, the second expression. Uh, so uh, I'm just giving you a, a very quick tour of this and then we'll get back to the phone cons. See how the whole thing is here. Just, just to give you an expression, uh, an impression of, the, uh, of how things look uh, in a real language specification. 
here we actually see a desugaring rule which is um, uh, independent of the uh, translations here. Uh, and um, the rest of that little language is with our famous while loop um, and uh, sequential here. And it all looks pretty straightforward. Note that the translation is defined on, on statements. And in fact, uh, blocks are a, uh, essentially a subsort of statements by being included here uh, as a, by a chain production. So we don't need to have a separate translation function for blocks. We just use, uh, just give some cases for the statements. And finally, the last file in this, um, apart from some boring stuff with disambiguation, is um, dealing with programs which have declarations at the beginning, and, and that's it. And that, that's the entire uh, little imp language definition. And um, one thing that you might have noticed or is that, in a sense, you might think of, of these as imports of those other parts. But actually, the, the, there's no um, import statements explicit. Uh, the, the fact that all the languages said language imp at the top is meaning that this is just a multi-file uh, specification of the same language. Uh, and there's no explicit paths, file names, imports, or anything. We can navigate around in our specification by clicking on hyperlinks without any knowledge of the file structure, the directory structure. There's no need to drill down through through trees of, di of um, directories to get down to a f file where you want to find something. Uh, I, I'm not aware of other frameworks that manage to avoid any explicit modular structure in this way. Um, and it fits in very well with the Spoofax um, support in, in that it has these hyperlinks that are, are quite natural to use. Um, so let me finish by just sh showing how it is to, uh, I, I'm not going to demonstrate how we generate, uh, or I, I could at least perhaps just show that there is a something in the menu that allows us to generate components of um, a language editor, but I'm not going to do that. Um, uh, what I will do is just find a test program. For instance, in the K2, I've um, stolen some examples from the K tutorial. So, for instance, um, very little. I mean, there's some more interesting ones as well, but um, it doesn't matter which we take. Um, perhaps take the small one because then we'll be able to see the, the full fun term that's generated from it. So again, we need to go up into the Spoofax menu here and generate funcons from that. And funcons are not intended as a programming language. So it looks very tedious and boring to read, um, but uh, we can run it and, and get the result. And to run it, uh, we have these external tools um, that um, called a Funcons interpreter, and it, it will just, um, it's not a very readable output. We, we need to fine tune the output a bit, um, but uh, that's what it gives for um, uh, doing that, whatever that program was supposed to do. Um, and hopefully it's the right answer. Okay, so that, that's what I want to do with the demo. Um, uh, the, um, I can, we can explore it more later if, if people are interested, uh, but now let me, um, get back to the presentation and keep me there, yes, good. Okay, um, so that's what you saw in the demo. We saw browsing and editing, so you can move around in a specification uh, very, very straightforwardly. Um, we haven't seen the Funcon specifications yet. We'll see that in a moment. Uh, and we can translate uh, programs to Funcons um, uh, using generated Stratego code, and we can run them using generated Haskell code. Uh, and I'll say more about the current state of, of, um, of, of that uh, uh, for, um, for use uh, later. Uh, we've um, done some various small languages as case studies, and also a major one, um, at least for us major, uh, which was Camel Lite, uh, quite a substantial subset of OCaml. Uh, and that's been written up, and you can find that online in, in a special issue um, for the Modularity Conference. And we've been, for, for a couple of years, we've been uh, plugging away at uh, trying to do a dynamic semantics of C-sharp, uh, even version 1.2, um, and it turned out to be more of a, an effort uh, for the resources that we had, um, and we're not there yet, and that's ongoing work. 
So we've been talking about language specifications. Now let's look at the actual definitions and specifications of the phone cons themselves. And I think, oh, I've, I've lost my time now, so I, I think we still have plenty of time. Uh, so, uh, uh, Benoit, we, ha we have about tw uh, 15 minutes, I think. 10, 10, 10 minutes, fine, that's, that's great. Okay, uh, these phone cons, let me emphasize again that they're um, intended to be fundamental programming concepts corresponding to these phone cons. We're essentially choosing a name for something that we should be familiar with when talking about languages like scopes or, or local um, or, or bindings or, or uh, assignments and things like that. We're trying to avoid use of notation which is strongly connected with any particular programming language. So, in, but in principle, in any case, the phone cons are independent um, of the syntax of any language. Uh, we're using prefix notation and hyphens in, in, in notation which tends to keep it separate from most languages. Incidentally, we use plural forms for types and singular forms for constructors to avoid uh, overloading problems. Each phone con is supposed to have a fixed behavior and new phone cons can be added. Can be added. So, um, to give you an impression of what we've developed so far with these phone cons, and as I say, this is an open-ended collection, um, so there's a fair amount of notation concerning values, primitive values, some of which are built in, um, composite values, uh, again, some of them are built in like sets and multisets we, we take for given, um, whereas others like lists we um, specify directly. Uh, then there are these values called abstractions, which are values, um, are values that contain unevaluated computations inside them uh, and used to represent uh, things like functions and uh, methods and procedures. And then there's one special value uh, that is in a type of its own, a uh, singleton type, uh, called none, which represents the absence of any of these other values. Um, but it's, in a sense, it's an element of the universe. And then we have the more interesting part. Values, really, every framework has a collection of values similar to that. The computations are the more interesting bit uh, in this FunCon universe. Uh, the computations, some of them represent uh, normal computations where things go on as normal and there's, there's nothing too exciting happens, you have uh, control flow. Uh, giving is when you compute a value and then refer to it later. Um, binding, uh, we are familiar with concepts of environments and so on. Storing with assignment. Linking is essentially uh, when one has a single, single assignment where you set up some links typically representing recursive uh, bindings uh, which are, um, once they're set, they can't be changed. But essentially it's a way of representing circular structures uh, using um, imperative updates, but you're not allowed to change them once you've set them up. Um, and then there's stuff with generating uh, fresh atoms and um, input-output. In the abnormal computations dealing with abrupt termination, uh, there's a ba basic notion of failure, um, which um, where we have a, a handler called else. And then we've already seen an illustration of how the handle and um, of thrown abrupt termination uh, reasons is handled. But we also recently, well, a couple of years ago, uh, added delimited continuations um, to the repertoire of phone cons. Uh, that was always a bit of an irritation that until, until then, uh, people said, well, right, phone cons are quite general, but you can't do delimited continuations in a modular way. And we found a way to do it in a modular way um, using that IMSOS framework. And that's written up in a workshop on continuations uh, paper. Um, and even though um, with the form of operational semantics used to define fun cons, I started out experimenting with defining um, primitives of concurrent ML with concurrency. We haven't yet got around to isolating what we think is a canonical set of fun cons for dealing with threads and concurrency and, and distributed processes. So that's work in progress. We're not intended to read everything on this slide. Uh, there's about uh, 500 uh, symbols there uh, representing all the notation that we have in our current collection. Um, that's just to give an impression of the scale of it. It's non-trivial. Um, and um, the actual computations part is just this last three columns. All that stuff is concerned with values. Uh, and so there's a lot more notation concerned with values than with computations. 
Uh, so if you're wanting to look at it, I recommend strongly to look at the, um, the, the parts concerning computations and maybe the parts concerning abstractions, uh, which are um, here. So these, these last four columns uh, are, are the ones that are basically interesting uh, from a computational point of view. Uh, we can take a closer look at some of those in the tool if, if, if anyone's interested. So let's look at some specifications. And what I want to impress on you is how simple they are, how, how easy they are. And I think they're competitive with other frameworks, um, in particular with um, the K framework and with PLT Redex, which are, are major competitors of uh, the framework that we have here. So this is our while true FunCon. The, um, these little arrows here, you can think of them much like in Scala, that they represent call by name parameters. Um, and they're saying that this FunCon takes two computations as its arguments, not two values. Uh, we'll have other FunCons that require their arguments to be values. So X and Y are computations here, and we just have a, a simple rule that rewrites this um, term to the obvious expansion. Sec here is sequencing, um, and uh, uh, so in the case that we have a false value, then we just terminate the loop. And um, this is for dealing with iterating statements, essentially. Uh, so uh, we restrict the, the type of value computed by the body to be no value, and then that's the type of the whole thing. And that's it. Well, is it that it? Because here we used if and else and, and sequencing, and we haven't defined those yet, so it's not entirely self-contained. But um, actually, in small step semantics, if we didn't already have if and else and sequencing, we need to invent them. We need somewhere to put the unevaluated expression and the unevaluated um, body of the while loop for the next iteration, uh, while we're iterating them in a small step style. Uh, if we didn't already have if then else and sequencing, we would need to invent them locally for expressing the semantics in this way. Uh, actually, of course, they're very sensible things to have already, and so um, we didn't need to do that. Here's the definition, actually, of if then else. Again, we're using this Scala-like um, in discriminating between arguments that are required to be evaluated in advance and those that are not. Um, in the K framework, they're called strictness annotations, and in a sense, they correspond to um, giving an evaluation context grammar that says where you're allowed to evaluate uh, terms, and it's quite concise. Um, uh, so, um, having done that, essentially there's an implicit rule generated from this signature here which um, allows the, the first arguments to be evaluated. And these other two rules only apply when the first argument has been evaluated, and that's all you need to say. So we avoid the need to specify those boring structural congruence rules uh, that um, people complain about in small step semantics. Okay, sequencing, that's it. Okay, again we're exploiting um, this is a, a value, even though it says no value, it's actually a value type. Uh, it's not a computation type. So um, we're required to ev evaluate this first. The only thing you can evaluate to is none. And once we've done that, then we can um, just get rid of it with sequencing. How, how much simpler than that can you get to specify sequencing? This is a bit more complicated because if you have several arguments that are all value arguments, then we generate a rule for each of them which allows interleaving. Now, you don't always want interleaving. If you have, it, say, addition of two integers, maybe you want left to right evaluation. This left to right evaluation, um, I won't go into the details here, it's using sequences of, um, so if you think of just the case where x is a single computation here, uh, then uh, we, we, the strictness in the first argument means that we evaluate the first uh, argument to a value and then we call left to right with the other value, and that only has one argument, so it evaluates it. And then once we've got everything evaluated to a value, then we return a sequence. So this allows us to take any argument sequence of a FunCon that might be evaluated interleaved and insist that it's evaluated left to right. Okay, so we, we can actually control where interleaving happens, but the interleaving is the default. If you don't specify anything, you get interleaving. If you insist on left to right, then you get that. 
Now for environments and things like that, so we have things called entities and um, environments are just maps from identifiers to either a value or no value. Um, and uh, we can look up the binding of an, um, an identifier um, just by having a premise that, so row here is, we, we don't have Greek letters I'm afraid, so we just have to spell out our Greek letters. Um, so the, um, looking up the, the value in this map here um, is uh, giving us either a value or a link. Links are used to represent recursive bindings. Uh, and um, th 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 there'll be another rule that follows the link in case we, we looked up and got a link. So uh, bindings are actually catering for circular bindings, which is quite a common feature of many languages these days. So I won't give the other rule. For scope, um, here's how it looks, um, much like in that IMSOS slide you saw some while ago. Uh, rather clumsy notation using ASCII forms of symbols, but um, essentially it's, it's the same, except that we, we exploit the strictness annotation here, uh, that we don't need to give the, the first rule that evaluates the first argument. We assume it's already been evaluated to an environment. And we only need to give the rules for that. But otherwise it's very similar to the um, IMSOS version. Now we had also this abrupt termination stuff um, and uh, so we um, see how we deal with that. So again, we have an entity. This time it's written in the middle of a transition arrow. So this is our notation that we, we say, okay, we have a, a term here, a term here, and we can insert this um, signal like a label in the middle of, a, of an arrow. So the funk on throw um, will actually not, not get anywhere because it's just going to transit make a transition to a stuck state, but it will have this label on the transition. And then when we specify the handler, there we can keep track of whether X here, the first argument, is making a small step with a default um, signal here where there's no value being thrown, so there's no abrupt termination, or whether it has a value here that signals abrupt termination, in which case the handler um, will uh, give that value to the, the, this handle thrown will uh, take that value from the signal here and uh, give it um, to be referred to in the handler Y. And if we finish by computing some normal value U, uh, then uh, we don't need the handler anymore. So that is a totally modular way of dealing with the, um, exception handling in, in modular, in this IMSOS um, style. Um, and again, we haven't mentioned things like stores. We haven't mentioned abrupt termination in our other rules. And we can throw these specifications together and they all make good foundational sense. Let me talk a little bit about foundations to finish because um, we're running short of time. Um, I'll make this very brief. So it's based on IMSOS, um, these Funcon specifications. Uh, and IMSOS is interpreted in, in terms of something called modular SOS, which I'll mention on the next slide. We have these strictness annotations using this uh, funny arrow. And actually, th there's a, a paper in FOSAX in 2013 um, introducing an, a special form of transition systems where one distinguishes between values and computations in a useful way uh, and distinguishes between transitions and rewriting steps. The nice thing about that is that we get a, 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 way, a format for writing rules that guarantees that bisimulation is a congruence. And also, we have bisimulation preserved by disjoint extension, which means any laws we prove based on our uh, transition rules, um, like, say, sequencing being associative, remain valid when we add further phone cons that don't give new rules for the same syntax. Just to briefly show what modular SOS, the underlying framework of IMSOS, is uh, there you have these long arrows with lots of things on top. So all the things like environments and stores and so on go into the labels. And there's a partial composability relation on labels that actually makes the label set into a category. The labels are the morphisms of the category. Uh, and um, uh, this gives um, the possibility of not mentioning things that are not needed. I don't have time to go into more details. The, the reusable components there are, are the label categories because again, we're using con using syntax of languages in, the, in this example. So the form of judgments there is just something where you take a transition from one term to another term with a fancy label. 
You could take alternative frameworks for defining funcoms. We have experimented already with using K and with using DINSEM, and both of them are pretty good. Uh, in Amsterdam, they experimented with using object algebras in a master's thesis. We haven't yet tried with RedX or monad monadic semantics or algebraic effects, but there are various questions I have about the, maybe some problems that arise that maybe the people here who know about those things can tell me whether they are justified, those question marks, or not. So one could imagine having parallel definitions of the same behavior for the funcons in different frameworks to allow use of different tools for reasoning or running the funcons. This was the big picture. Language specifications using translation to funcon terms. You've seen how they look. You've seen how the funcons are defined and that we can add new funcons. The conjecture was that this will significantly reduce the effort of language specification. I don't know whether you believe that based on the examples you've seen, but I, I think the translation equations are pretty straightforward. And it's not you that's doing the work for the, um, defining the funcons. It's, it's um, us. Uh, so. um, and we are about to release for review um, a version of I mean, version is the wrong word because we're not going to version uh, our funcons. We're making a beta release of what is intended to be the final collection of the initial collection of funcons, open to extension but with fixed notation. Now, the trouble is once people start using that, we can no longer change it. it if, because if we change notation or change interpretation, then all those language specifications built on our stuff will get broken. So until we make the final um, the final release, hopefully in the first half of next year, things may still change. So it comes with that caveat. Um, what we would like, because as you saw, there, there's a lot of notation there. We've done our best, I'll, I'll say who we is in a moment. Um, we've done our best to make things polished and, and readable, but maybe other people have better ideas and can help us get things even better. And so if anyone's interested in this, we'd be very, um, very interested the current participants, just a small group of us, um, that were funded for four or five years um, in the UK. We are very much open to other people coming in and getting in on the act. Um, and just let me know if you'd like to be involved. And then, um, what is the current work? I mentioned static semantics. That's a topic of active interest at the moment. We'd like modular type soundness proofs based on the modular static semantics for funcons, which would induce a, a static semantics for the language translated into funcons. We obviously need to improve the tool support. We need funcons for threads and concurrency, and we need to complete this C-sharp case study. So let me leave that as the last slide, and thank you for your attention and patience for this talk. Thank you.